ammonites are very common fossils, and you will find plenty of videos about them. So, why make another one? Think about a famous painting. Everybody who looks at it sees different things. Any art speaks to people and means something personal. It's the same with ammonites. As a true nature's work of art, they are beautiful, and each one is unique. We are going to review the specimens from our collection, and those that we caught on camera elsewhere. Let's enjoy them together. The ammonites were mollusks from a group called cephalopods. The name cephalopods reflects the fact that these animals have tentacles attached to their heads. Modern day cephalopods are nautilus, squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. By the way, scientists believe that the soft bodies of the ammonites resembled squids more than those of the living fossil nautilus which is considered evolutionary less advanced than ammonites. Ammonites supposedly had eight arms arranged in pairs, along with two longer tentacles. Most of the ammonites had coiled shells. The shell coils when a mollusk produces the shell material faster on one side than the other. The shell of an ammonite consisted of a living chamber where the body of the mollusk resided and a spiral part with multiple chambers. This part is called phragmacone. In most cases, the living chamber is destroyed, leaving only phragmacone to be preserved as a fossil. So, we are actually looking at broken shells, no matter how beautiful they are. The function of the phragmacone was to enable the ammonite to float. The chambers were filled with a mix of gas and fluids, making the average density of the whole animal similar to that of the water and creating so-called buoyancy. The gas inside the chambers is likely formed through a process similar to the one observed in sparkling water and is controlled by the exchange of sodium and chloride ions across the wall of siphuncle. The siphuncle is a tiny tube running through all the chambers of the phragmacone. It is an important feature of the chambered shells, allowing the mollusks to adjust their buoyancy. One of the key differences between nautiloids and ammonoids is that nautiloids had a so-called median siphuncle, which was located right at the center of the chambers, while ammonites had a lateral siphuncle, located at the external edge of the spiral shell. Look for that tiny tube to check whether your specimen is actually an ammonite. Here is a distinct siphuncle of a shiny ammonite. This fossil contains pyrite, an iron sulfide also known as fool's gold. It is yellow and shiny when fresh from the ground, easy to mistake for the real gold. The problem with pyrite ammonites, and those are quite common in collections, is that with time, the mineral gets oxidized and loses its integrity and attractive metallic luster. Ideally, the specimens have to be stabilized for longer preservation, but shelf life of pyrite ammonite in its full glory is short since the shine fades away anyway. By the way, if you strike pyrite with another pyrite or chert, you can get sparks. The origin of the word is connected to the ability of pyrite to ignite fire. This ancient technology is called stone on stone and was used before combination of flint and steel was introduced. So can you make a fire using a pyrite ammonite? It probably depends on the exact mineral composition of the fossils, but those with shiny crystals inside the chambers may work. The walls separating chambers inside the shell are called septa, septum if singular. They can be slightly curved, but in many instances have a wavy and branchy structure. Here is a fragment of a baculite, an ammonite with a straight shell. The specimen has empty chambers and a well-preserved septa, which creates a labyrinth inside the shells, which, by the way, were originally made from a material called aragonite. In the specimen, fossilized aragonite has a light brown coloration. Who knows how it was colored when the animal was alive? Supposedly, it had some sort of stripes to camouflage the mollusks from the predators like marine reptiles. The pattern of septa is a feature of paramount importance for the classification of the ammonites. Nautiloids always have plain, concave septa, and if you see complex patterns of the septa, you can be sure that this is an ammonite. Look at this intricate design of septa, revealed after the layer of mother of pearl was removed. Gorgeous! 
Here are a few micro photographs we did to reveal the complex morphology of the septa in these specimens from Madagascar. The chambers were filled with glittering quartz crystals during fossilization. The combinations of form and color are endless. I've seen some stunning display pieces. The fossilized mother of pearl can be quite colorful and iridescent. This mineral is called amylite, and it's advertised as one of the rarest gemstones on Earth. It's being commercially mined in Canada, but you can get a glimpse of it in specimens from other localities, like Madagascar or Russia. It resembles opal due to the light diffraction that separates colors of incident light in a rainbow-like fashion. Similarly to opal, many jewelry pieces are composite or layered. They are made from dark rock covered with thin layer of iridescent amylite attached to it. In addition, it's treated with stabilizing resins to prevent flaking off the material. Ammonites can be tiny, less than a one cent coin, but they could reach six feet or two meters in diameter. Some books mention differences between the shells of a male and a female ammonoid, but it's really hard to prove this theory. In fact, paleontological records are fragmentary and, as a result, female and male specimens can be easily described as two different species. This may happen to animals fossilized at different developmental stages or even different parts of the same animal. There is just no way to know unless some rare specimen is discovered and new information is taken into account. Nevertheless, careful and meticulous studies can reveal some hints based on the frequency association of shells with different exterior morphology and common features in internal structure. The general consensus is that female ammonites were larger than males to accommodate the development of eggs. Scientists also look for the changes in the growth pattern associated with breeding cycles of females. To make things more complicated, a few species of cephalopods developed two distinct types of males within one species. Those may differ in size and mating behavior. The ammonoids, as well as modern nautiloids, were predatory and fed on shrimp like crustaceans and probably crabs. Talking about hard shell food, ammonites had some curious parts. It's a pair of symmetrical plates which looked a lot like shells of a bivalve mollusk and were often mistaken for those. But in reality, they belong to ammonites and were located near the opening or aperture of the shell. The name is Apticus, and the function is still a little bit of a mystery. The early theory was that they could have been used for protection from predators, like a shield. But the most recent hypothesis is that they were low jaws, which ammonoids used to crush their prey. This specimen looks pretty much like an Apticus, but we are not 100% sure. Apticus was made of calcite covered with organic material, unlike the aragonite shell of an ammonite. It is quite possible that the Apticus had double use of a jaw piece during hunting and a cover at the moments when the animal retracted inside its shell. Since Aptici are rarely found with shells, they have their own independent classification. Ammonites are quite common fossils and, of course, they have their share of folklore starting with the most famous legend about ammonites being snakes turned into stone by Saint Hild. The absence of the heads in ammonites was explained by another spell, the beheading spell of Saint Cuthbert. Although carving a little head at the end of the ammonite shell could have been a profitable business idea, and ammonites with carved snake heads were possibly popular local religious souvenirs in medieval England. The ammonites were actually called snake stones, and similar myths existed in other parts of Europe. In the opinion of ancient Greeks and Romans, ammonites resembled horns rather than snakes. The name of horn god Ammon was used to identify the coiled fossilized shells. In the ancient world, the shells of ammonoids were called horns of Ammon, and many scientific names of the species have Greek root ceres or horn at the end. Did you know that there was a tribe or a nation in eastern Palestine called the Ammonites? The Ammonites mentioned in the Bible are not fossils. The empty space formed by the coils in the center is called umbilicus, by the way. This is a distant relative of the Ammonite, a cephalopod called Orthoceros. It also has chambers and siphuncle, 
but the shell is straight and its cross section looks like a multi-story house. Such fossils once were called pagoda stones in China due to their resemblance to famous types of tall ancient temples. Ammonites appear in rocks dating back to the early Devonian age 400 million years ago. And, as a group, the Ammonites persisted for over 300 million years, surviving Permian extinction that wiped out trilobites and significantly depleted the list of species of crinoids and brachiopods. They lived to be hunted by marine reptiles and went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period. Thanks for your time and attention. Look for the links in the description to learn more and subscribe if you want to support our channel and see more nature videos. Good luck! Thank you.